So I think what you're hearing tonight is really just a, a huge diversity of opinions, but the thing we all share in common as citizen scientists is really this duty we feel uh, to, to help human flourishing and make the world a better place. And what I'm going to tell you about is really one of the key problems that confronts us just societally. It still remains true despite all the renewables and penetration of those that over 90% of the world's energy is generated by carbon intensive sources. Okay? So this is a magnitude of a problem that we're dealing with. So if you just think about an average commuter, you know, I just you know, went to the grocery store and came back. We're not doing anything serious here. We're not driving to LA every day. Um, you're thinking about four tons of CO2 per year. Now, what this means in terms of impact, uh, according to my calculation literally on the back of an envelope, um, this is about a volume of 42 feet. Now, I just looked around this theater, and it strikes me that this is maybe of that similar dimension in every direction. So if you think about you, your neighbor, everyone in your row producing this volume of CO2, and this is not a huge theater, you start to grasp the impact of this, right? So globally, what does this mean? 32 gigatons, which is a number that itself, this almost seems like a made up word, right? What does that mean? So that's a, a billion tons. So if you had a million tons, you would need a thousand of those to get to one gigaton. So overall, this would be like, I know we don't really have snow here unless you go to Tahoe, but it would be like if you were six feet deep in fresh powder of CO2 over the entire United States. That is the magnitude of what we're dealing with. Okay, that's a problem. So the problem is made manifest here in this chart over time. I won't belabor this because there are plenty of documentaries and movies that go over this, but this is really just over time our historical concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. And you know, I'm not here to uh, sort of change any minds on this topic, and I'm, I'm definitely not Al Gore, but uh, what you can see is that we're having an influence. And the nature of that influence, uh, I think almost certainly, is not great. I think we can agree on that. So how do we go about thinking about this problem of CO2 and mitigating it? Here is your average 500 megawatt power plant, right? And this is good, at least if you like to charge your devices, if you like to make PowerPoint presentations. It's a, something we all collectively just agree to do as part of human society. And the problem with that is that the CO2 problem, right? And what's best practice today is called uh, a mean scrubbing. Now, the details of that is sort of captured by this little diagram here. Now, the, the reality or the scientific basis for this is just that amines, nitrogen-rich compounds, you can think of fertilizer if you want. Some of these materials actually look quite similar in terms of chemical structure. They bind to CO2 very, very well, okay? Now, they bind it so well, in fact, that it takes a lot of heat and thermal energy to release it. Now, this is, in a way, useful because you can release it when you want to, right? And you can capture CO2, which is good. In a way, it's not useful but because it requires a huge amount of energy in order to do that. So if you want your clean skies and you're using carbon, and again, I hope we transition to less carbon intensive fuels, but reality is this is where we are now as, a, as the globe. So what do you do with that CO2? You can either put it back into the earth. Um, you can think about fossilizing it, essentially, making minerals. I mean, Michelangelo's David is actually made out of calcium carbonate, or turning it into fuels. This is actually the next talk by Kendra Kuhl will tell you about this. But the problem with all of these approaches is that you're putting about a 40% financial penalty on the energy that you're generating just because it binds CO2 so strongly and requires so much thermal energy to release it. So the reality is that these aren't really implemented very widely. So what can we do? There is actually a passive way to separate things that you want from things that you don't want. And sort of, I would wager that probably 95% of the audience goes through this process every morning. Um, this is called filtration, or the scientific version of this is a membrane. Uh, if you want, you can be a, a membrane caffeine specialist or something like that if you want to really impress your family later. Uh, and the idea here is that we have pore sizes or gaps or openings in our membranes of just a size that we can separate out what we'd really like to put into our bodies or take use of, ca you know, coffee, obviously in this case, maybe I need some. Um, and sort of leave behind everything else that you're not really interested in. So in the case of a power plant, which emits all kinds of nitric oxide, sulfur dioxide, hydrogen, water, nitrogen, I mean, all kinds of other byproducts, there's plenty to separate out, okay? And that's actually part of the problem for CO2 separations, is that when you're feeding it this sort of toxic brew that's coming out of there, 
it's very, very hard to isolate the CO2, which is what you'd really like to do work with. Okay? Now, what we've done in the lab, and the, the sort of invention that I'm going to tell you about, is using these specifically designed chemical frameworks. These are called metal organic frameworks. You can think of these like sponges. They are open networks, and they have metal sites, and they have atoms in them placed just so to bind carbon dioxide lightly, not strongly, and to give them kind of a pathway for which they can move through molecules, uh, sorry, move through, uh, move through membranes. So our idea was we put these molecules, these MOF molecules, into standard membranes to really optimize our filters for CO2. That was the big idea, okay? So the reality was a bit trickier than that. That sounds just totally easy. Why, why isn't everybody doing this? Why am I here? Uh, well, MOFs, much like Chin, Chinny showed you in the first talk, are basically salts. They're, you just crystallize them at room temperature. So it's really, really hard to think about how you would pour industrial mixtures through that and do anything useful. So our magic in my lab is really making hybrid materials. And for that, we're taking plastics. You can think of Play-Doh. It's fine. I'm not judging. Uh, and you can mix these together. And if you do it and get the chemistry just right, you can make test membranes like this. Okay. Now, with this membrane, what you can do is something very, very interesting. You can still be very selective for grabbing CO2, but you can get a lot more going through. Right? We've done basically an eight-fold enhancement just by putting the MOFs into a standard sort of commercial-ready membrane. And this is getting close. This is our really just our first set of experiments, and this is something we're carrying on in our lab. But we're not far away in phase space from being competitive with this process, just at a very, very low energy price. Right? So how this really manifests uh, is just shown here in this movie. And we have these little pathways of these metal organic frameworks, these MOFs, these sponges through here, that give highways that are very, very selective for CO2. It would be like if you had a, sort of a fast pass. Uh, you would be able to go back and forth on the highway with greater ease while everybody else is clogged up in a traffic jam. Right? This is an analogy we can all appreciate, um, I think, here in the Bay Area. So this is really the vision for how these work and how these scale up. And you can really integrate them directly to a power plant with much lower footprint. Uh, a lot of the amine scrubbers actually are almost uh, sort of comparable to the size of the stacks themselves. So what this means in summary is that when we're doing our energy generation, if we're able to implement these CO2 selective membranes, what we can do is we can basically strongly mitigate this 40% energy penalty and maybe get rid of it. And what that does is that decreases you know, the price of our energy, which is great, and also mitigates the carbon intensity of it, which is something I think we can all agree on is really just a better way to live. So thank you for your time. <laughs> <laughs>